Halo Combat Evolved, originally meant to be a one-off game, was a monumental success for Bungie and Microsoft. With the game having sold around 3 million units in less than two years after its release, generating millions of dollars in revenue. With the success of the first game, Bungie began work on Halo 2, which was released three years after Combat Evolved in 2004, just in time for the holiday season. And it was around this time that I received and played the game for the first time on the original Xbox. Looking back, Halo 2 in my view stands as one of the best sequels ever made, and sets the foundation for the series' overall popularity going forward. With numerous improvements implemented, and even stronger story written that improves over the first game with a more engaging multiplayer component, that made its way into the professional gaming scene, including TV show appearances and a very robust soundtrack, Halo 2 is quite arguably the best game in the entire series. While I was already a fan of the first game, I didn't become a lifelong Halo fan until Halo 2. Similar to my retro on the first game, I will be addressing only the campaign, skipping commentary on the multiplayer component of the game. Halo 2 begins with a trial of an unknown Covenant Elite Commander who is blamed for failing to prevent the destruction of the Halo Ring from the first game. This Elite is stripped of his rank, branded a heretic, and tortured by Tartarus, a chieftain of the Brutes, a new alien race, a part of the Covenant not seen in the first game. The leadership of the Covenant, the Three Prophets, Truth, Mercy, and Regret, give this Elite a chance at redemption by offering him the rank of Arbiter. This unique rank is given to elites at times of great crisis. The Arbiter is sent to quell a rebellion against the Covenant being forced to kill the rebellion's leader who has descended from the Prophet's promises. The Arbiter later comes into contact with 3 for 3 Guilty Spark, the monitor from the first game. While the Arbiter is stripped of his rank, back on Earth, Master Chief and Avery Johnson are being commended for their efforts in destroying the Halo Ring from the first game. Miranda Keyes, the daughter of Captain Jacob Keyes, who was killed by the Flood in the first game, accepts a Medal of Honor on the behalf of her late father. A fleet of Covenant ships led by the Prophet Regret appear on Earth, invading the African city of New Mombasa. Master Chief is sent to the city to stop the invasion. Regret's fleet is destroyed, but he escapes through a hyperjump in space. Keyes follows Regret to discover another Halo ring. Realizing the danger that comes with the installation, Keyes orders Master Chief to find and kill the Prophet Regret, while she and Johnson search for this Halo's activation index. Regret launches a distress call, and the Covenant ship known as High Charity, along with an entire Covenant fleet, arrive on the Halo ring. Master Chief manages to hunt down the Prophet Regret and kills him. The Covenant bombard his position, and Master Chief falls into a lake where he is dragged away by an unknown presence. The death of regret causes disarray in the Covenant as the remaining two prophets give the Brutes the Elite's traditional position as their honor guard. The Arbiter returns and takes the activation index from Johnson and Keyes, who are both captured. Tartarus appears and informs the Arbiter that the prophets have betrayed the Elites, ordering their execution. After falling into a chasm, the Arbiter meets what the Covenant refers to as the Demon, or the Master Chief. Both characters find themselves in the clutches of the Flood through a creature known as the Grave Mind. The Grave Mind reveals that the Prophet's so-called Great Journey is a lie. It sends both the Arbiter and Master Chief to different locations on a mission to stop Halo's activation. Master Chief is sent to the Covenant ship High Charity, where a civil war has sparked within the Covenant's ranks. The UNSC ship in Amber Clad from earlier in the game becomes infested with the Flood. The ship crash lands with the Flood soon infesting the entire city, and the Prophet Mercy is consumed by the Parasite. The last remaining Prophet, Truth, sends Tartarus with Johnson and Keys to activate the Halo Ring. Master Chief follows Truth aboard a Forerunner ship, leaving Cortana aboard the High Charity to destroy the ship and Halo along with it if Tartarus is successful in activating the Ring. Back on Halo, where the Arbiter was sent by the Grave Mind, Johnson joins forces with the Arbiter, who are then joined by other elites, the Grunts, and the Hunters, versus the Brutes and the Jackals. They both confront Tartarus in Halo's control room, where the Arbiter attempts to convince Tartarus that the Prophets have lied to him and the Brutes about their proposed great journey. Tartarus refuses the Arbiter's claim and activates Halo, where a battle ensues, ending in the death of Tartarus. Keys removes the activation index, which sets an entire series of different Halo installations on standby for remote activation. The Monitor refers to this as the Ark, which now threatens all life in the galaxy. 
The Prophet Truth arrives on Earth as Admiral Hood questions why Master Chief is aboard the ship, to which he replies that he's finishing the fight. The game ends on a rather infamous cliffhanger, which many story threads are left unresolved, and high stakes hang in the balance. We later learn that Cortana, back aboard the High Charity, which has been taken over by the Gravemind, is confronted by the creature, who has some questions for her. Halo 2's story is a significant improvement over the first game, which had a great story on its own. The main reason it works is because it properly balances the story of two different characters, while further exploring the factions that were underdeveloped in the first game. This is the first time that we're given not just an in-depth, but an actual hands-on look into the Covenant, and how the Prophets have deceived multiple races of aliens with their religious beliefs. In a way, Halo 2's story could be viewed as a commentary on how dangerous religion can be when it's paired with political power. The Arbiter is also a fantastic new addition to the series as he gives the player further perspective how the Covenant operates since they're in full allegiance to the Prophets, who have no problem killing anyone who dissents from their beliefs. The Flood returns in various ways in this game and are emphasized with the reveal of the Grave Mind. The introduction of new characters combined with a greater focus on the antagonist faction and a deeper, more complex story gives Halo 2 more narrative weight than the first game had. Gameplay-wise, Halo 2 was also a significant improvement over Combat Evolved in more ways than one. Bungie chose very specific areas to upgrade. One of the biggest improvements is the ability to dual-wield weapons. This changes the game considerably. Now you can carry up the three different weapons at a time through the use of this new mechanic. What's more, the player can interchange both UNSC and Covenant weapons using both simultaneously. You can dual wield plasma rifles, pistols, plasma pistols, and more. The new weapons, such as the UNSC SMGs and battle rifle, give the player more options in how they tackle enemy waves, offering new options for both the close range and long range playstyles. On the Covenant side, you now have access to the Covenant's battle rifle the sci-fi equivalent of a sniper rifle with an overheat cooldown system. You have the Brute Plasma Rifle, which is far stronger than the standard plasma rifle, but it overheats faster. There's the Brute Shot, which is a very risky grenade launcher weapon type, but good to handle a cryo. The Fuel Rod Cannon, which is an equivalent of the Covenant's rocket launcher seen in the first game, but unavailable to players in Combat Evolved, is now available here. Another weapon seen in the first game but was unavailable for use is the Energy Sword, which changes the game considerably since it's purely a melee weapon. Capable of use at a distance for a lunge attack, but best used in close proximity to conserve its ammunition. And it birthed the Fantastic Sword's gameplay variant in Halo's multiplayer mode, making it a standout game type for an FPS game. The Sentinel Beam, which comes in both the standard and the stronger blue variants, are critical on higher difficulty settings against the Flood, and useful on armored opponents. Finally, there's what I consider to be the best weapon in the entire game, which is the Covenant's version of the UNSC Battle Rifle, the Covenant Carbine, which is effective against really anything. When paired with a plasma pistol, the damn thing is an unstoppable beast.
Notably absent from the game is the UNSC Assault Rifle, which is replaced by the Battle Rifle, a precision weapon meant for long range, but the Assault Rifle does return in Halo 3. The final major improvement, which was a weak area in the original game, are the vehicles. Halo 2 improves the vehicles exponentially. Now when you're driving the Scorpion tank, you can aim to the left or right and still move forward without aiming the camera in the driver's direction. The Ghost now has a boost mechanic that is made great use of in the new Mombasa level in the tunnels, and the vehicle in general controls far better than it did in the first game. The Banshee can now boost as well. In addition, it has more aerial maneuvers and it handles far better than it did in the Combat Evolved. New additions include the Gauss Warthog with its electromagnetic cannon, capable of taking out infantry in one direct hit, and vehicles in a few shots even on Legendary, and the Covenant tank, the Wraith. Seen in Combat Evolved but unavailable then, becomes available now for the first time, complete with its catapult-like fire design, and a short boost that will destroy smaller vehicles when in range. Also, you can now hijack vehicles, which is a perfect counter mechanic to the problem of the vehicles being overpowered against players who don't have a vehicle of their own, both in the campaign and the multiplayer modes. You can hijack any vehicle in the game, whether it's ground or air base, as long as you can get within range up close. New enemies include the Brutes, who will enter into a feral state when their health runs low and their armor has been destroyed. Most weak against headshots, encouraging the player to use precision weapons like the battle rifle or the more powerful Covenant Carbine. And the drones, insectoids who always appear in a swarm, dangerous up close but easily dispatched one by one at a distance. Finally, the musical score in this game features a greater musical range, experimenting with different sounds and styles to create a much stronger, more robust soundtrack than what was in the first game. Hey! I had a trap! Yeah, that's the way. Well, let me know when I can start trying. Bloody fuck! Original game! The anniversary version of the game oddly replaces the rock tracks that play in different key moments of the game that come from both Master Chiefs and the Arbiter's gameplay sections. This is very noticeable on the High Charity when the Anniversary Edition replaces Breaking Benjamin's kick-ass war-themed track, Blow Me Away, with something else. The best track in the entire game, in my opinion, is the Mausoleum Suite, which complements the Flood. Played in the Arbiter's gameplay sections, but best experience outside of the game entirely. Go on. I'll follow when our reinforcements arrive. Halo 2 is the perfect example of how a sequel can improve on its predecessor by addressing issues from the first game, while giving the player more options for an overall greater experience. With all the improvements that were made, it's forgivable that the story ends in a rather anticlimactic cliffhanger that wouldn't see a proper ending until three years later with the release of Halo 3.